Pepsi-Cola, P-E-P-S-I. That's your smartest cola buy. Pepsi-Cola presents Counter Spy. Washington calling David Harding, Counter Spy. Washington calling David Harding, Counter Spy. Harding, Counter Spy, calling Washington. United States Counter Spies, especially appointed to investigate and combat the enemies of our country, both at home and abroad. Tonight, the case of the Society Swindlers. Another counter-spy report to the American people. Brought to you each Tuesday and Thursday by Pepsi-Cola. Pepsi-Cola gets a spot. Two full glasses, that's a lot. That's right, you heard what they said. Two full glasses of sparkling Pepsi from one big 12-ounce bottle. You're getting an extra glass full. And what a delicious glass full. The most refreshing, delightful cola that ever tickled your taste. You can't top Pepsi's tangy flavor. And that big, big bottle saves you money, goes twice as far. Pepsi's America's big, big favorite. And America's biggest cola value. So why take less when Pepsi is best? Whenever you reach for refreshment, remember... Why take less when Pepsi's best? And now, to Counter Spy. Twenty-two stories above the streets of Manhattan, in the paneled library of a penthouse, a well-groomed man in a satin smoking jacket sits at a heavy oak desk. His eyes are fixed impatiently on the sweep second hand of his unique alarm wristwatch as a dark-haired woman reads from a list. General and Mrs. Ralph C. Maxton, Dr. and Mrs. Charles Nestor, Commissioner and Mrs. Stephen W. Otis. Oh, by the way, Alfred, Mr. Otis has just been elected chairman of the Board of General Oil. I know all about Otis. Please continue, Carla. Mr. and Mrs. George R. Pace, Ambassador and Mrs. Victor... (laughs) Ambassador and Mrs. Victor Pagano, Mr. and Mrs. Lance... That'll be all, Carla. Uh, Alfred, I haven't finished the list. You heard my alarm watch. Time is up. Three and a half minutes. You're a strange man, Alfred. Time is money, Carla. About that list. See to it that the guests appear at Mrs. Grayson's party for the World Refugee Fund. With my name on the invitation as co-hostess, no one will dare refuse to appear. Mm. They're all deadly afraid of what I may write in my weekly column. One unkind word from Countess Carlo Maroni, and they're in hot water. Uh That title pays you real dividends, doesn't it? Thanks to your cleverness in organizing the World Refugee Fund. Oh, dear sweet charity. What a blessing to mankind. Mr. Batson. What is it, Zero? Paulson's here. It's... Twenty seconds late, Zero. Yeah, I know, boss. I kept them out in the hall, like you said. Let's see. It's two minutes to eight. One minute and thirty seconds. That's enough time to give Paulson. Alfred, you'll be back. In one minute and forty-five seconds. All right, Zero. And down the hall. Zero. Did Paulson walk up? From the 20th floor, is I order? Yeah, boss. Everything's set. Good evening, Paulson. Hi, Mr. Babson. You want to see me? Uh, Paulson, you worked the room that table for me at 11 of our charity parties. You're an excellent group, yeah? And I pay you well. No complaints, Mr. Babson. Uh, then, Paulson, why did you withhold some of the money from your table at last night's party in Philadelphia? I'll give you exactly 20 seconds to explain. I... I don't get you. I was watching you, Paulson. You cut yourself a nice slice. Oh, you got me wrong, Zero. I wouldn't do a thing like that to Mr. Babson. You're a liar. Zero, let him go. Okay, boss. I I can explain, Mr. Babson. There's no time left to explain. You wasted it lying. Please, just give me a... You heard the boss. Time's up. Get moving. Zero, open the elevator door for Paulson. With pleasure, That's the way out for you, Paulson. The the elevator's not there. It's 22 floors below, and you're going down to meet it. 
What? You're taking a suicide dive, Polson. That's why I had you get off at the 20th floor and walk the rest of the way up to be sure you wouldn't be traced to my penthouse. All right, Zero. So long, Chisler. Ah! Mm, one minute and 30 seconds on the nose for Paulson. Time to just right, Mr. Babs. Of course, Zero. That's the way to treat time. Exactly right. Good evening, Countess Moroni. Why, Alfred Babson, charming of you to come. I hope this party will provide you with plenty of material for your society column. Oh, yes. And the roulette table's just piling up money for the World Refugee Fund. Ah, sweet charity. <laughs> I got your signal, Alfred. Anything wrong? Come into the study, Carla. Have a minute and a half to talk to you. Carla, I heard something this afternoon that may mean trouble. Oh? About a man called George Walsh, the cleverest and biggest fake charity organizer on the West Coast. I've just learned that Walsh is headed here to begin operations in East Coast society circles. But Alfred, we have that big affair at Vera Ashton's home outside Washington next month. Are you afraid of trouble over that? That you can leave to me. More important, Carla... Yes? You are a valuable asset in this business if Walsh should try to buy you away from me. Don't you trust me? You know about Polson's suicide? The same thing could happen to anyone else who double-crossed me. Ah, my watch tells me our time is up. I have to be going. See you soon, Carla. Countess by headquarters, is it not? I wish to see David Harding, and I don't need your help for that, young man. Uh, madam, you shouldn't be in this corridor at all. You'll have to be announced. That's the rule. Rule. <laughs> Government by bureaucracy. It wasn't this way when Grover Cleveland piloted our ship of state. Uh, who shall I say is calling? I'll say who's calling when I get in there. Very sorry, madam, but I can't Young like... man, remove your hand from my arm or I'll slap your face. Very well, <laughs> rough him. An organization of ruffians. So there you are, David Hardy. Well, fear right. For a moment, I thought a tornado hit the building. We have an appointment, I think, David. Vera, you haven't changed a bit. Now sit down and cool off that temper of yours. David, I have a good mind to send a letter to the president about the way you run this office, and I would. <laughs> if I didn't love you so darn much. <laughs> You're a sweetheart. Oh, you're not fooling me with that sugar talk, David. Why did you ask me to come and see you? Vera, I see by the columns that you're giving a charity party next week out at your place in Chevy Chase. It'll make every other affair this season look sick. Countess Carla Maroney is my co-hostess. And the proceeds are to go to the World Refugee Fund. Now, Vera, as a favor to me, I want you to switch your sponsorship to another charity instead of World Refugee. Davis, are you mad? Why, Countess Maroney is making all arrangements. Her name on the invitation is a guarantee of success. My agents, Vera, have been investigating all organizations sending money overseas for relief. Most of them are worthy groups, but we've uncovered a few exceptions. 
The World Refugee Fund is one of them. Ridiculous. Here's a cable report from our attaché in Paris. The World Refugee Fund is a phony front for a charity record. Countess Maroney should be told about this. Our records show that every charity party sponsored for World Refugee was arranged by her. You mean she... Then she should be arrested. Oh, no, no. Just now, she's of much more value to us on the loose. Now, I'm interested in getting at the big brains behind this sleazy racket. And I've already started a trick to smoke him out. You want to help? David Hardy. That's the silliest question you ever asked. Then I'll let you in on a secret. A big West Coast charity racketeer, George Walsh, is coming east to operate in society circles. His assistant, a fellow named Ralph Harrison, will be with him. And he's going to call on you, Vera. Good heavens. Oh, David, is this another of your techniques? <laughs> Still can't fool you, can I? But seriously, Vera, I hope to trap that unknown racketeer behind Countess Maroney. And there's nothing like the assumed threat of gangland claim jumping to bring an unknown criminal out into the light. But, David, what has a fight between criminals to do with me? Vera, I'm making your charity party next week the battleground. Mr. Harding, I found this memo from you on my desk. Oh, yes, Peter. Mr. Ralph Harrison has a five o'clock appointment tomorrow in the solarium of Mrs. Vera Ashton's home. What's it supposed to mean? Just what it says. You'll keep that appointment as scheduled, Mr. Harrison. And uh, now, Mr. Harrison, allow me to present you to my dear friend, Countess Carla Maroney. Countess? How do you do? Carla, darling, as I told you on the phone, Mr. Harrison is assistant director of the Federation of European Charities. Uh... Do sit down, both of you. Thank you. Some tea, Carla. I can only stay a moment, Mrs. Ashton. You said you wanted to discuss something with me about our party here on Friday. Yes, I, uh, uh, well, you see, Carla, darling, Mr. Harrison's been showing me amazing figures of the work of his organization in the rehabilitation of war orphans. And he has convinced me that the proceeds of our party should go to his group instead Mrs. of... Mrs. Ashton. Our party was arranged for the World Refugee Fund. Besides, the invitations are all out with my name on them. Well, I'm sure the Countess won't mind lending her name to another worthy cause. I certainly do mind. Mrs. Ashton, unless you go through with our original plan, I'll have a great deal to say about it in my newspaper column. Good afternoon. Just a minute, Countess. May I see you to your car? Excuse us, Mrs. Ashton? Certainly. This way, Countess. Countess, I want to talk to you about George Walsh. Walsh? Mm-hmm. He likes the way you work the angle. He's my boss. And he's ready to offer you double the percentage you get now. I don't know what you're talking about. Countess, we know you're in the racket. Racket? What impudence? I'm at the Crescent Hotel, Countess. You can call me when you decide to accept Mr. Walsh's offer. Hello, Mr. Harding Peters. How'd you make out, Peters? So far, so good. Then don't come back here to headquarters. Meet me in half an hour at Pennsylvania and 18th. Okay? Okay, Dave. Hello? Hello? Carla, this is Alfred Babson. Oh, at last. When did you get into Washington? About 20 minutes ago with Zero and the other boys. I'm stopping at the Hotel Newton. I've got to see you at once. What's wrong? That trouble you anticipated. It's here, in Washington. Hey, mister, is that light? Yeah, here you are. Car in the corner, Peters. Mr. Harding's waiting for you. Drive over the viaduct, Peter. All right, Chief. Now, Peter, <clears throat> the New York field office has just come up with some interesting information. It may be the tie-in we're looking for. Shoot. 
Three weeks ago, a man named Steve Polson was killed when he fell or jumped down an apartment house elevator shaft. It turns out that Polson was a croupier at the charity parties for the World Refugee Fund. Any evidence of murder? No, but the penthouse of that apartment building is leased by an Alfred C. Babson. Any dope on him, Dave? No, Babson's a society playboy, and a checkup shows he's been an invited guest to all the parties. And he's right here in Washington. Arrived less than an hour ago. Just a minute. Harding, car one, go ahead. J-12 reporting, Mr. Harding. Countess Maroney just went into room 907 at the Hotel Newton. Register shows room occupied by Alfred C. Babson. Thanks. Peters, get back to your room at the Crescent. Now, if Countess Maroney's with Babson now, I think you can expect a phone call from her very shortly. I'll be most interested to know her proposition. In just a moment, we'll return to Counter Spy, brought to you by Pepsi Cola. Pepsi Cola hits a spot. Two full glasses, that's a lot. Lots more value, lots more zest. Why take less when Pepsi's best? More and more, among fellows and girls, among mothers and dads, you hear that sane and sensible question why take less when Pepsi is best? No budget, no allowance ever had a better friend than tangy, sparkling Pepsi Cola. Because one big 12 ounce Pepsi bottle gives you two delicious drinks. That's twice as much tangy taste, twice as much delicious Pepsi to go just twice as far. That's why more and more families say, why take less when Pepsi is best? Yes, families like yours and mine, families all over America, they're all saying, why take less when Pepsi is best? Pepsi-Cola hits a spot, tastes terrific when you're hot, more and better than the rest. Why take less when Pepsi's best? Today, tomorrow, always. Get America's biggest cola value. Take home a carton of six big, big Pepsi bottles. Insist on Pepsi at the store. And say Pepsi at the fountain. Say Pepsi at the stand. Say Pepsi. Whenever you reach for refreshment, remember... Why take less when Pepsi's best? And now, back to Counter Spy. In a Washington hotel room, charity racketeer Alfred Babson and Countess Carla Maroney are discussing George Walsh's offer. I see, Carla. Walsh's offer is double whatever I'm giving you. Alfred, I told you I can be trusted. Boss, we better pull out of this caper. Yes, Cyril? Why? We heard Walsh is a tough customer with a mob of gorillas. Maybe, but I'm not letting this plum fall out of my hands into his lap. Carla, the first step is for you to call this man Harrison and arrange a meeting right away. You'll take him for a drive across the river. Why park here, Countess? I want to talk to you alone, Mr. Harrison, about the offer you made me on behalf of Mr. Walsh. You ready to switch over to the smart money? I've been thinking about it seriously. Can I tell Mr. Walsh it's all set? Yeah, you can tell Walsh it's all set. Hello, stranger. Okay, Countess, go take a walk. Yes. All right, Zero. Nice dame, the Countess. Look, Harrison, my boss has a proposition for your Mr. Walsh. And what's the gun for? Just to make sure you listen. Now, my boss figures there's plenty for two outfits in this territory. If your Mr. Walsh wants to play nice, okay. If he don't, then there's a lot of shooting. And And that means the law. And none of us makes out. And it's a deal? I'll have to talk to Mr. Walsh. What's his cut? He and my boss can talk that over. Where and when? You bring Walsh to the Ashton Dame's big party tomorrow night. My boss will be out on the terrace. There'll be a white carnation in his buttonhole so you can spot him. A white carnation? You two show out on the terrace at 11, on the nose. Do you think Walsh will go for a sit-up like that? This is Ashton's party at 11. The chief meets your boss. Yeah. Yeah, Zero. 
I guarantee you my boss will go for a setup like that. All right, Zero, get going. What took you two so long? Boss, I told you on the phone I closed the deal with Harrison. Then I took him to where he could get a cab back to Washington. And Zero had to pick me up again. After all, this is my car. Very well. You keep driving around a while, Zero. And this is the safest place to talk. Has something new gone wrong, Alfred? No, but I'm sure Walsh will try everything to put me out of the way. But this time, Carla, he's meeting his master. No, Alfred. No more murders. I... I want to get out of this. Carla, there's only one way out of this for you. The way Paulson took. Now, Zero, about the plan. This is to be timed to the split second. At Mrs. Ashton's house, there's a set of French windows which lead from the drawing room out to the terrace. Carla, at exactly four minutes before 11... You will go into the drawing room and switch on the lights. Yes. I want Walsh and Harrison silhouetted plainly against those French windows. I see. There's a row of bushes at the rear of the garden, a hundred yards from the terrace. I'll jockey Walsh and Harrison into position in front of the window. At 11.01, I light a cigarette. Zero, that will let you know you have exactly two minutes to get ready. I'll be ready. At 11.03, my alarm will go off. You won't hear it, Zero, so keep your eyes on your own watch. At 11.03, you fire with the telescopic sight. One shot for Walsh, one for Harrison. And remember, both of you, timing is everything. <laughs> Dave, I've got something that could have helped us on this case. And what is it? Well, I took our specifications for a miniature camera to one of the best manufacturers in the country. Told him the camera was to be used as standard equipment for all counter spies. Their production engineer gulped a couple of times and put our camera on a priority basis. Yeah. Well, here's a dummy model. Hey, Peters. This certainly is a honey. Mm-hmm. Simple to operate, sturdily built, and films can be bought anywhere. The manufacturer really did himself proud. He's even going to use a faster lens, for one thing, and the camera will be lighter in weight. Uh -huh. When can we get these in quantity? I'll phone him you're okay. He'll start deliveries right away. Do it. Too bad we couldn't use one of these cameras tonight on this Babson case, Chief. It'd be just the thing. Yep. I'm sorry, Peter. But make your phone call and let's go. We've got a bit of a ride out to Mrs. Ashton's house in Chevy Chase. Countess coming out of the drawing room. Now, Vera, your cooperation is of the utmost importance. David, I'm worth any ten of your agents. I'll keep that miserable Countess creature away from the terrace, all right. I'll talk her deaf, dumb, and blind. Vera, I love you. Well, I'd better get started. Come on, Peter. Let's go out on the terrace. Right. there by the French windows, Dave. That must be our man. Oh, white carnation in his lapel. Uh, pardon me. No? You have the time? Oh, yes. Yeah. Just 11. We're on the nose. As Zero said you wanted it. You, Harrison? That's right. This is my boss, George Walsh. Walsh? This is a pleasure. My name's Alfred Babson. Babson, the pleasure's all mine. Chief's been looking forward to this meeting, Mr. Babson. Yes. And now, Babson, I'm sure I'm going to get just what I came for. Walsh, haven't I seen you someplace before? I've been seen a lot of places before. Hmm. Cigarette, Walsh? No, thank you. Allison? Thanks. Lion? Mm-hmm. Walsh? 
Well, Waltz, we'll have everything settled in less than two minutes. We both know what we want, and I'm a stickler for time. I noticed that wristwatch of yours. That's an hmm? alarm on it. Nice gadget. No, thank you. I had it made especially. Now, Walsh, let's hear your plan. Okay, Babson. Here's my plan. Oh, Don't try to get out of it, Babson. My arm. The more you struggle, the more it'll hurt. Oh. That's a hammer hold that she's got on you, Babson. <clears throat> Keep it up and you'll have a broken arm. Oh. Oh. That's better. Oh. What's the idea of this, Caper? Go on, Babson, over to the French window. Oh, wait, Move, what? I said. What? French window? We can't stand here. No? Somebody will see us. We, we'd better go inside. We'll talk right here, and you've got only 60 seconds left. Hmm? 60, Babson, only 60. You're right in front of me, Babson. When Zero shoots from those bushes down there, you get it first. Oh, yes. You know. After the Countess made the appointment to meet my assistant, I had her car wired for sound. What I heard you, Zero, and the Countess say sounded very interesting. That's in 45 seconds left. What? I'll be killed. Tell him not to shoot. 40 seconds, Babson. Now you're getting just what you gave Steve Polson. Well, I, I had killed Polson. I, I, I couldn't trust him. 35 seconds left. Don't let Zero shoot. Stop him. Walsh, I'll give you anything you want. Sounds as if you have an offer for me. 25 seconds, Babson. Walsh, I'll clear out of the charity racket. You take over the whole operation. Everything. The Countess goes with it. You can have it all. 15 seconds to go. Didn't you hear me? I'm giving you everything. 10. No! Don't shoot! It's me! Don't shoot! Now exactly three minutes past 11. It's me now! Don't shoot! Don't shoot! Don't shoot! Don't! I wasn't shot. No. But that shot. Fired by one of my men as a signal to let me know that everything down there was under control. But zero. We got zero. And with your confession, Babson, the government closes this case. Government? Babson, while your mouth is open in that stupid gate, keep it that way. Mr. George Walsh here is David Harding, chief of the counter spies. That's right, Babson, and I can guarantee you personally, when the time arrives for your trial, the jury isn't going to show you any charity. When your friends drop in, be generous, but be thrifty, too. Serve plenty of delicious Pepsi-Cola. Pepsi's big 12-ounce bottle gives you not just one sparkling glass full, but two. Get a carton of six and serve 12 delicious drinks. Yes, Pepsi is America's biggest cola value. You get twice the tangy taste, twice the refreshment, twice the Pepsi. So why take less when Pepsi is best? Whenever you reach for refreshment, remember... Pepsi-Cola hits the spot, two full glasses, that's a lot. Lot more value, lot more zest. Why take less when Pepsi's best? Tune in every Tuesday and Thursday, same time, same station, to Counterspy. Listen on Thursday for the exciting Counterspy case of the high-class hijacker. Bottle of chloroform, drops of green oil, and eyes without a body, the result is unpredictable. Add these ingredients to a clever and dangerous underworld operation, and the result is action. That's our case for next Thursday, day after tomorrow. I invite you to be listening for Case of a High Class Hijacker on Counter Spy. Tonight's Counter Spy program originated in New York was directed by Leonard L. Bass, dramatized by Edward J. Adamson, and featured Don McLaughlin and Mandel Kramer with music by Jesse Crawford. Counter Spy is a Phillips H. Lord production for Pepsi-Cola. Enjoy some Pepsi, ice cold tonight. <laughs>